Yes. All right. So I am in uh, Matthew 26. And the first 16 verses of the chapter describe to us two meetings that were taking place at the same time. Two meetings that were taking place at the same time. Uh, from verse two, from verse three uh, to verse five, there is a first meeting there in the house of the high priest and the Pharisees and the experts of the law uh, in that meeting plotting how to deal away with Jesus, how to kill Jesus. And they are deadlocked in that meeting. They don't know which is the best way to do it because they are afraid of the crowd. If they do it in a way that is in a public way, they do it during the feast, they were afraid to provoke the crowd. The crowd. So they were really deadlocked there. They were looking for a way to carry on their plots. The thing that strikes me there is they're plotting. They're plotting against the Lord. And um, just before I go on there, that, that I just want to say there are many plots against God's people, but that come to nothing, come to absolute nothing, because the Lord is victorious. We are in his hands. We are, we are his. And when I say there are plots against us, I don't want anybody to, be, to fear at all because Jesus has already conquered all our enemies. But the plot is there. The second meeting is in from verse 6 to verse 13. It is in the house of Simon the leper. Simon the leper has finally organized a meeting to praise God, to give thanks to Jesus for cleansing him from leprosy. Now, those two meetings are very strange meetings. There's one meeting they're plotting against Jesus. There's another meeting there someone has organized to praise Jesus. And uh, Simon the leper was healed uh, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, when Jesus was coming down from the mountain. And I don't know why it took him so long to organize something, but I can understand as a leper, he didn't have much. And probably took him a long time to gather a few things to be able to invite people to his house. Uh, but eventually, there is a meeting here in Bethany in his house that he has organized. And Jesus has been invited there, and many other people have been invited there. The whole purpose is to stand up. I mean, I'm, well, well is to declare the goodness of God to him. Yeah. And it is wonderful to be in such a meeting where there is one person, two people, three people declaring the goodness of God to them declaring the wonders of Jesus that they have just experienced. It's getting increasingly rare. Some of our, many of our meetings, we know how it starts, we know how it goes on, where it ends. And we don't expect that there should be some wonderful testimonies, wonderful declarations of God's faithfulness. So it is refreshing to see a meeting like this in a man that was a leper. Now, it was right for him to organize this meeting because he had suffered in his life. Because of his leprosy, he had been ostracized, isolated, and according to the regulations of the Old Testament, he had no fellowship with anybody. And I don't know who went and preached to him. Somebody must have gone to him and told him about Jesus in such a convincing way that he was willing to risk it and get off it out of his isolation and go amid the Lord. Some of the most wonderful preachers in the Bible, their names are not mentioned. Somebody to go into some place to go and meet somebody like this who has been rejected for a long time and speak convincingly about Jesus until the leper left his house and came into a crowd to meet Jesus. And when the man came, we, we, we read the story in chapter 8, how he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And uh, he was praying with a fear in his heart, heart because he has been rejected all this while. And we know the response of the Lord who stretched forth his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be thou cleansed. And the man was cleansed. And joy filled his heart that day. And I'm sure he wanted to say thank you, thank you. I'm sure he said thank you, but it was not enough. So this day in his house, that house that nobody could visit in the past, there's a feast in that house because Jesus had touched the owner of the house. And the, 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 the vis among the visitors in Simon's house, was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Mary and Martha had something too that Jesus had done for them 
and they also wanted to give thanks to Jesus. So we have at least two people, three people in that meeting that have experienced the power of God and they were in that place to glorify God, to give thanks to God. Wonderful meeting, that is. Jesus was the center of it. Whatever Simon said was about what the Lord had done. And when Mary saw that, she went back to her house, as we know that story, and took her precious, precious, costly perfume and brought it there because she had seen the glory of God. She had seen Jesus. She had seen Jesus raise her brother from the dead. She had seen something that she never thought was possible. The, the demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ to change the desperate, well, to bring the brother back, not just from the dead, but from the grave. And she too had been thankful to God, but this was an opportunity in this meeting for her to express that gratitude to God in a, in a creative, wonderful way. And so she brought her perfume. So in that house, there were two people, or well, three, I would say Mata was amongst them. I would say Lazarus too was thankful. He was the beneficiary of that miracle. There was at least four people in that meeting that has seen the glory of God and the power of God. And, and, and I'm sure that they changed the atmosphere of that meeting and the Lord's name was exalted and glorified. In the meantime, there were some people in that meeting, uh, his disciples, they were not so excited. So strange to see that. And uh, so as they're giving thanks to God and giving testimony to the faithfulness of Jesus, oh, but before I go on, I want to say, I pray God that our meetings will become lively meetings. Occasions where Jesus is the center, and this one declares how he has touched his heart, how he has opened his eyes, how he has saved him from sin, how he has delivered him from this, and this one declares, and his name is glorified, and worship arises from people's hearts. That is, that is the hunger and thirst that I want in my heart, that are things I want to see in our meetings these days. Our meetings should not just be moments where we sing our normal songs and say our prayers and go. But Jesus should be the center because of his recent miracles, of his recent touch, of his recent wonders that he has done in this life and in that life. Now, I can only talk like this because, well, the last time I spoke to you, I spoke about being crazy for Jesus. Now, what makes somebody crazy for Jesus? What makes somebody beside himself is when he has been the beneficiary of the grace of God in a fresh, new and living way. And I know that as far as the Lord is concerned, he wants to multiply miracles. He wants to give us things for which to give him thanks in a living, in a new and living way. He wants to, to do things in us personally that will make us go to bed giving thanks to God, get up in the morning, give thanks to God. for. And so that meeting in Simon's house was a wonderful meeting, contrary to the first meeting we saw where people were making, were plotting to kill Jesus. This is another meeting here where Jesus is lifted up, he's glorified. And when Mary brought her perfume into that meeting, with gratitude in her heart, she, as we know the story, she opened it, she broke it, she poured it upon the Lord. And uh, wow, she changed the atmosphere of the whole place. It's something she never read from a book, something she didn't hear from somebody. It came from her heart. It was a reaction of her spirit to the miracle, to the glory of God. She had seen revealed in what Jesus had done to the brother. And so there were two miracles there. Simon had a miracle. Mary had seen a miracle. Martha had seen a miracle. Lazarus was a symbol of the miracle. That meeting was wonderful. Yeah, that meeting was wonderful. And so when Mary did that, Judas, Judas saw it and was not happy. It's a strange thing how some leaders sit down in meetings and their hearts, because of experiences in life, have gotten so cold, so cold that anybody that worships the Lord with all their hearts provoked them in the wrong way. When Judas saw it, he reacted. He opened his mouth. Up to that moment, he said nothing. Up to that moment, he has been sitting down as one of the, tw one of the chosen twelve. And when Mary did that, he opened his mouth and he said, what is this waste for? We would have sold this for this amount of money and given to the poor. That is an attempt to divert people's eyes from Jesus, from, from worshiping Jesus, and to turn them to something good, to turn them to something that, that is always happening in meetings. It always happens in our relationship with the Lord. 
the, the Holy Spirit wants us to be engrossed, to be carried away by what Jesus does, by who he is. And very often there's this conflict of things around us seeking to draw attention, not bad things, good things, humanitarian things here and there. They're always there. We always have them. But when, G when Judas opened his mouth and said, this is a waste, this is a waste. I can imagine the shock that Mary had because that voice was the voice of an apostle. But Jesus quickly got up and, and said to them, and, and basically said, leave her alone. You know, I can, I can almost hear the Lord saying, leave her alone. When somebody has experienced the miracle of God or seen the glory of God, and there are these voices that are seeking to divert them and distract them, I can see the Lord intervening there. Leave her alone. She has done a good work. She has done a good work and she has anointed my body. What Jesus interpreted that act to be is something that Mary never thought about. Sometimes you do something to the Lord and when the Lord receives it, he says something about what you've done that's bigger than what you ever thought about. He, she has anointed my body for burial. And as a sign that I'm very pleased with what she's done, wherever this gospel shall be preached, what she's done shall be, they will talk about it in memory of her. Now, when Judas heard Jesus tell her him to stop what he was doing because Mary had done a good job, Judas was offended. He left the meeting. In verse, in verse, in, in verse 14, Judas leaves the meeting. He leaves a meeting where God's name has been glorified, where people were praising God and worshiping Jesus for his miracles. He leaves the meeting, meeting worse up than he came. In the place of worship, in the place of praise, in the place where there's evidence, there's proof of the power of God, of the faithfulness of God. Somebody sits down there. He doesn't receive it. He doesn't participate in it. He tries to oppose it. And when the Lord says, no, it must continue, he gets offended, leaves the meeting with an offense. It is, I want to encourage you, brethren, that when we are in the presence of the Lord, when we are with him, beloved, let's open our hearts. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to take us on along with what God is doing. Let nobody sit down on, on what he's thinking, up, up, on, on his opinions, upon his ideas, because, well, we, we may miss out what God is doing at this season. He is doing wonderful things. He's doing great things. And I don't want any idea or anything that has been happening with me in my life to hinder me from being involved, getting involved in what God is doing. The apostle left the meeting, was off. And when he left the meeting, this is the strangest of all. He went to the other meeting in the high priest's house. And I'm sure there was a knock at the door as the high priest and the religious leaders were there, deadlock, not knowing how to go about their plots. And I'm sure there was a knock on the door and they opened it and they saw an apostle. They must have been shocked, those people. They thought, probably thought that he was a spy. What's he come to do here? He's not one of us. And they were more confused until Judas opened his mouth. He opened his mouth and he said, what do you give me? I will give him to you. I will, leave him, I will deliver him to you. What will I gain? He's bargaining. He's looking for some gain. His heart has been closed. He's been to meetings. One meeting after another, he's been to meetings. He has been with Jesus. He's eaten with Jesus. He's seen miracles. He has, seen, he has received the love of God. He has, he, he, but, but his heart has been closed and closed and closed. And here he is somewhere in a meeting, in a place he ought not to go in the first place. Because there are places we should not go. There are powers we should not fellowship with. There are spirits we should not entertain at all. He is there asking for some gain. What will you give me? What can I have? A terrible thing that an apostle was following Jesus for what he will have, what he could get. And the people looked at him, those people looked at him and said, well, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a slave. That's some, something that would have made the man to think twice and said, all of this for that? How can I leave that meeting? How can I be with the Lord all these years? And I come here and I'm bargaining for something only for this? But the man was so so angry, so disappointed that he accepted and he took with his own hands 
something from the enemies of Jesus and put it in his pocket. And he left the meeting with something that he had received that would destroy his life. He was in the meeting of worship. He was in the meeting of praise. He was in the meeting where the power of God was being declared. He did not receive anything. He has gone into this trench meeting and he has gotten some money, put it in his pocket. Well, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about, well, maybe money, but it was bad money. It was blood money, but it is whatever we have received. It, it is terrible to fellowship with the enemies of the Lord and to receive something from the enemies of the Lord and put it in your heart. To receive ideas, to receive opinions, to receive things that undermine the gospel, to receive things that will undermine your own life, that will undermine your own faith from people like that. It is a dangerous thing, brethren. And so he came back, having received that money, and sat down on the table with the Lord as the Passover was prepared. And he sat down there with something in his pocket that ought not to be there. And very often, beloved, we are in meetings holding on to some opinion, some idea that we got that ought not to be there. And I'm, when I'm talking like this is this, I, have, I said to the brethren today, and I say to everybody, if we want to see the power of God, if we want to experience the glory of God today, we must purge ourselves from all those preconceived ideas, those opinions that are not glorifying Jesus, those things that we have received left and right from different people that ought not to be in our minds or in our hearts. The Lord must purge us of those things so that we have space and room for the word of God, for the will of God. He came and sat down there on the table and they were eating past the Passover and Jesus knew what was going on. And Jesus did not expose him because Jesus was trying everything possible to win over the man. We know how Red Jesus gave him. And when Jesus gave it to him, it was a sign of his love. It was a sign of his care. It was almost like the Lord saying, stop on your tracks. Stop on this road you've taken. Don't continue. Well, the man had been an apostle. The man had been called. The man had been with Jesus for many years. But at this very moment in time, he was involved in something that was hidden. Hidden in his heart. The Lord knew it. Nobody knew it. He knew it. And the Lord was loving him, doing everything to get him to turn on to stop and turn his heart. But when the man received that peace from Jesus Christ, he, he, he got even angrier. He thought that the Lord had exposed him. He got even angrier in the presence of the Lord. And he got up there and the devil took over him and he went out of that place. And it was the dark and it was night. It was the last meeting he had with Jesus. I'm not, we didn't have this Zoom meeting for me to do that kind of a story and leave us there. No, 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 we're just going somewhere. After that meeting, Jesus took the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I'm so glad that Jesus came to this place, the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm so glad that Jesus felt the need to come into a place where he will pray. If there's something I want to say, in, uh, to say today, in this, our generation, is that there is a need. I don't even need to say that. Anybody who follows the Lord knows in themselves that at this moment there is a need for each one of us to seek the Lord's face, to get out of the crowds, to get out of the, of the masses, of the, to, to, to find a place for yourself where you can actually pour out your heart to God as Jesus did in the garden. Jesus felt the need to pray. Why did he feel the need to pray? Because... The, the hour, his hour had come. When he came into the world, he knew what he came for. He prophesied that he will be arrested, he will be persecuted, he will be killed, and he will be raised again the third day. He spent his time talking about it. But when the real time approached, when the reality approached, he found in himself a hesitation, a weakness. Jesus. And he felt that he needed to go to his father about it. And he took three friends, three friends to go and pray with him in the garden. 
When he reached the garden, he put the three friends at a distance. And every one of us must know a place with the Lord where friends stay behind. There is a place for each person where you go with your friends, but they stay behind and you go alone with the Lord because you are going to pour out your heart to the Lord in a way that not, you, you are going to, if, if you're speaking in tongues, speak in tongues. If you're speaking in a language that only God can understand, speak in a language that only God can understand. But he is waiting for us to come, especially in those hours when we are facing things that are more than us, beyond us. I am living, I am talking to you like this, brethren, because I have been living in the past months facing things that are beyond me, more than me, mountains on the left, mountains on the right, and all my experiences of the past cannot help me here, and I have had to learn, and I'm learning to come to the Lord, and sometimes I pray with my wife, sometimes I pray with the brethren, but sometimes, beloved, you have to go alone and close the door and be alone, because there's a place that God wants to deal with each one. It is deeper than any human being can ever know. It is personal. It is for the husband. The wife should never know that place. This is for the wife. The husband should not know that place. It is personal. It is intimate. And Jesus left the three there and he went further and he fell down on his face. And he said, Father, if it be possible for you to remove this cup from me. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Not my will, but yours be done. The Hebrew letter comments on this story for us in Hebrews chapter 5. It says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus Christ prayed. He pleaded. He cried unto the one who was able to save him. And he was heard. It is the Hebrew writer that informs us that when Jesus prayed in the garden, he was heard. God heard his prayer. God answered his prayer. He prayed, he prayed for that first prayer, that first time, and he poured out his heart to God alone. And he portion was there. He realized that his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. His spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. So he prayed for God. He prayed for God to enable him, to strengthen him. And he came back and met the apostles. They were sleeping. They were sleeping. And he asked Peter, couldn't you watch for me for one hour? And he went back this second time and said, Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, your will be done. And he came back and they were sleeping. And he went back the third time again. And Luke tells us that he prayed, he sweated until the sweat turned into drops of blood. He prayed until he got an answer. As the Hebrew writer says, he received he was heard. He was heard. When Jesus stopped praying, he stopped praying because he had the assurance from his father that his prayer has been answered. He received strength by the answer God gave him. He received power by the answer God gave him. And an angel came to him and strengthened his body. So in his heart, he received an answer from God. His body was strengthened and he came back and now he could face the future. I can say the victory on the cross, the victory, the power that we shall see Jesus manifest. Oh, he received it when he prayed to God and God answered him and we assured him. And oh, hallelujah. And his body was strengthened to face life. How the church needs this, how every individual needs, needs this. In every family, in every life, in every church, in every nation, there are sufficient things waiting for us. And God alone knows, beloved, that to have victory, to face life and glorify God's name, we all need to be in such fellowship with God that he answers our prayers. And we know in our hearts that he has answered us. He gives us strength in the inward man. And you know, God has strengthened me. It was when Jesus was praying that he, he after he prayed, he came and told the disciples, watch and pray. Lest you yield into temptation, you, you yield to temptation, you yield to temptation. What's the temptation? I'm, I'm willing to do the will of God. I want to do the will of God, but my body, my spirit, my, my flesh is weak. That is the temptation. By praying, God gave him power and authority to overcome that temptation, not to yield to that temptation. 
But beyond that, to face the circumstances, to face the hour of darkness. And when he, came, when he received the answer to his prayer from his father, when the angel strengthened his body, he came and told the disciples, now the time has come. The person who has betrayed me is at hand. And the apostles were surprised by the hour of darkness. was not so proud. His spirit was full. Power. He came up, was one of his friends, one of his close friends, Judas, leading a band of people to come to him. He saw it. He saw it. But when he saw it, beloved, his heart was ready because God has just strengthened him. God has just given him authority. When he saw Judas coming, leading that band in his heart, instead of anger, it was compassion. Instead of anger, it was grace. Instead of anger, it was mercy. To have mercy is not a natural virtue. To forgive is not a natural virtue. I tell you, beloved, to face life, to face circumstances, to glorify God, we need to be strengthened in our inner man by the power of the Holy Ghost. We need to be strengthened by God answering our prayers. We need to have the word of God in our hearts. We need each one of us even to live in the house where we live. And Judas came and Judas had told those people that the person that I will give a kiss to is the one, I arrest him. And when the people came, Jesus, Judas came to Jesus and Jesus showed him his cheek for Judas to give him a kiss. And he said, friend, you betraying the son of man with a kiss. Now, if you've not understood anything I'm saying now, I'm going to begin something here because actually I was building up to what I want to say now. When those people came with Judas to arrest Jesus, John tells us in his gospel that Jesus saw them and said, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. When they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said, here am I. The people went backwards and fell down. The power of God struck them down. And I'm sure when the power of God struck them down, those apostles were to see the manifestation of the great power of God. I'm sure they looked at one another and said, aha, praise God, we knew that that's how mighty he is. But the people who fell down got up again and came back to his answer. And they fell down again. And there says nothing can hinder him, nothing can hold him. And then the people got up and came back again. And the apostles got the shock of their lives. This Jesus willingly, willfully humbled himself and handed himself to these people, these same people that have fallen to the ground twice. Jesus humbled himself, gave himself to them. Don't say they arrested him as if they're arresting a thief. No, he gave himself to them. They've just been falling to the ground under his authority. But he willingly, voluntarily humbled himself and handed himself to them. That's one of the things that has shocked me these days as I have been considering the power of God, victory over sin. Jesus Christ, with all this great power that has just been manifested, has humbled himself and handed himself over to these people that have been falling over all over the place in his presence. What humility is this? What power is this? Beloved, there is power in humility. There's power in giving and humbling, submitting ourselves to God. Today I said to the brethren that the time has come when those people in authority, when those who have had some experience with Jesus, faced with situations like that, will stop arguing, stop affirming themselves, stop, stop fighting and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, with the word of God in our hearts, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Nothing, we are not in danger to anybody. 
What a wonderful thing to learn this thing afresh. I said in the church today that when my children were young, I was much younger. I didn't have the wisdom I now have. And uh, today I'm much older. You can see already. I'm much older and they too are older. And so when I go around visiting them and we're chatting, one of the things I'm looking for is for some to, to bring up some stupid thing I did in the past. I want to make things right. I want their hearts to be washed. I don't want that my old arguments, my old manners, beloved, should stand on the way of the power of God. This time Jesus is teaching me something else. If you want to have spiritual authority and power over the devil and over sin, one of the things is to humble ourselves. Let go of the nice opinions, the nice heart, and humble ourselves. When he gave himself to these people, the disciples forsook him and ran away. That's not what they expected. They went off. And Peter followed at a distance. Jesus had said that before that, that night, before the cock crows, uh, two times he would deny him three times. Peter followed him at a distance because this Jesus, he has never known him before. The, the Jesus that he knew was a powerful, mighty Jesus that spoke to the waves and the storm. This Jesus This Jesus Oh Jesus Oh God have mercy on Jesus Can you hear me? Do you hear me brethren? Yes, we can, Blasius. All right. This Jesus, this Jesus that has just given himself to these people, the apostles have never seen Jesus like that before. The Jesus that they have been following for three years had all power, all authority over things. The Jesus they've known in three years back walked on the seas when the waves were agitating all over the place. The Jesus they've known in the past could speak to the winds and say, be peace, be still, and the winds will stop. The Jesus that known the past had just said, I am the one, and people have fallen to the ground. But this Jesus that's humbling himself, willingly becoming weak, they've never known him before. They've never seen anything like that. And so they ran away, and Peter was so disappointed. Of course, he cut somebody's ear off. Well, uh, uh, somebody's ear off. Uh, and, and that's one thing that happens when... We have not been pouring out our hearts before. We have not been receiving God's word in our hearts. When our prayers, we don't have that place of intimacy where God speaks to us and, and strengthens us inside. One thing that happens is that we are surprised and we take out the arms of the arm of the flesh. The arm of the flesh. Well, he cut off somebody's ear and Jesus had healed it. And on top of everything else, this Jesus had just handed himself over to these people. And he's falling at a distance. And he came into the courtyard. And he came there. And uh, this Jesus was led into the high priest. And um, Jesus took there. Now, Jesus stood in the heart, they arrested him. And when they were in that house, they started looking for reasons for, for faults, for witnesses, for people to testify against Jesus. That is from verse 57 to verse, to verse 67. They're looking for witnesses. They're looking for, for motives. They don't arrest somebody before looking for what he has done wrong. When you arrest somebody, it means you know what he has done wrong. They arrested him and put him there. And they were looking for witnesses to testify against Jesus. And the shocking thing is that people came. In all to testify against Jesus. And their witnesses, their testimonies did not agree together. I 
at last two people came and took something that Jesus said and twisted it. Neither did their testimony agree to. And uh, in verse 62, Jesus remained silent. The high priest took matters into his own hands and he got up and said, tell us, are you the Messiah, the son of God? Jesus I'm not sure if we can reconnect with our precious brother. I think. It looks like he's still connected, Daddy. He's just muted. Maybe. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah, you're back, brother. Jesus is standing. <laughs> yeah. right. Good. Jesus and all these crowds, are, there is peace. He's not angry. He is not irritated he has authority he has full authority the waves that he controlled the waves that he used to speak to the waves at the stop there is no wave a rising wave of anger in his heart he has full authority when i see jesus in the high priest hut when i see him quiet when i see him not answering when I see him not angry, angry, I see the power of God. I see the power of God to stand accused falsely. You are not angry. I see the power of the Holy Spirit. I see the power of faith. He was there loving them, compassionate on them. They were accusing him falsely, but his response was compassion, love, kindness. That is the power of God. I mean, that's wonderful. Now, I, I'm, I'm saying this because today, many Christians are victims of their circumstances. Victims of what people have done and victims of what people have not done. There is something that the Lord can do in our hearts and he wants to do in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit that will give us the authority, the ability to live even in a burning fire, flame and not be burned. You go through floods, you will not get drowned. Not because you are strong, you are weak in yourself, but you are kept, you are kept by the power of God, kept from anger, kept from irritations, kept, kept from vindictiveness. I see Jesus, I see something in Jesus here that my heart goes for it, my heart longs for that. I want the same power, Lord. When they said he's guilty, they tied his face, they maltreated him, they, they, they beat him, they did all kinds of things against him. But Jesus stood there and offering to God with a pure heart, with a pure mind. No sin, no sin as a reaction entered into him. No sin, not at all. That is power. I love that power. That power that Jesus has, beloved, to reign over people's sins, over bad treatment. That power is greater than the power that raised Lazarus from the dead. 
Jesus said, greater miracles shall we see, shall we do? Greater things. He said to Nathaniel, you shall see greater things. I believe now that the greater things that Jesus wants to do in our hearts is to give us authority in our spirits over sin, over anger, over the way people behave to us. We shall still be hurt. But when you are hurt, you will receive authority and power from God, not to accuse people, but to turn to Jesus in order to be healed. They treated him terribly. Some people spat on his face. Now, when you spit on somebody's face, now spitting is a terrible thing. When you spit, it means you are nauseated. When something is not nice, you spit. But to spit on somebody's face is to declare to the person that his very presence there makes you nauseated. They did all kinds of things to Jesus. But he stood there. He received everything. He received everything. But what came out from him? What was his reaction to that? It's the manifestation of the great power of God in Christ. Uh, Jesus had victory over sin before he, 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 he defeated sin on the cross. He already had victory over sin here. He had victory in his spirit here. What a life. What manner of man is this? What power is this? No wonder. No wonder as they were treating him like that. Some young girl came to Peter and said, you're one of those. And Peter said, no, 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 no. No. A few moments after, another, another young lady came and said, well, you were with them. Peter said, he swore no. After a while, some guards and another young girl came and said, the very way you talk shows that you were one of them. Peter said, according to my new living translation here, if what I am saying that I don't know him is a lie, let me be cursed. When Peter said that, the cock crowed. Wonderful. That cop did not sleep that day. That cop was waiting for that moment. I mean, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't know whether you have cops in Canada or you have cops in other places. We have cops all over the place. Now, when Jesus said to Peter that before you deny me thrice, you, before, before the cop crows twice, you deny me thrice, I'm sure he put that cop there. That cop did not sleep that night because God had put the cop to be there to watch what is happening and to, and to remind Peter of, his, of the word of God at the right time. <laughs> No, no, you know, the Lord is able to use nature and to use anything, beloved, to, to awaken our consciences. And I'm sure that spectacle that was going on in, 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 the, in the high priest's house, it was a spectacle watched by angels, watched by demons, watched by the creation, watched by cocks, watched by animals. Watch, it was a spectacle. The creation of the whole was there being Peter said I don't know him the cock said oh and Peter turned when he heard the cock to see whether Jesus had been hearing and his eyes met with Jesus's eyes and the man realized that everything he had done was exposed had been seen and he saw who he was wow and he went outside there and he wept bitterly it is true what Peter said I don't know him because this aspect of Jesus he had never known before. This Jesus he had never known before. He'd known this, he had known Jesus in another, in another domain, in a, super, in a natural domain. In a, he'd never seen Jesus so vulnerable, so weak, yet so powerful. Yet so powerful. That Jesus standing there, beloved, being treated that way is the power of God. He had authority over everything. Thank God that when Peter will go out and weep bitterly, Jesus, when he raises, was raised from the dead, will go to him and find him again and give him hope again and love him again to life and bring him back to, to faith. And I'm glad that on the day of Pentecost, because it is this man, beloved, that stands there. He was coming, the revelation of God on the day of Pentecost and declared the word of God with such power and authority. 
I'm so glad. I'm encouraged by that. But what I wanted to say this evening, brethren, is this. The Lord wants to so move in our hearts that we should be able to live wherever we are living and not be victims of our circumstances or victims of people's attitudes. But we should find in Christ strength by the help of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin, to overcome everything else, to glorify God. Those three boys were thrown into a fiery furnace in the Old Testament and they lived and they walked through fire. We see Jesus here, beloved, in something worse than a fiery furnace. And he is there. He is alive. He is alive. He has power. In his humility, he has power. In his humility, he has authority. He's not using the authority for himself. He is an offering to God. And the Hebrew letter tells us that by the eternal spirit, he offered unto God an offering that was spotless. What an offering this was. That to go through all of this, beloved, and be offered unto God spotless, kept by the power of God. Hallelujah. May the Holy Spirit help us, beloved, to see that there's something greater the Lord is doing and wants to do in our hearts. Beloved, to so fill us with strength that our circumstances will remain the same, but we will be in those situations, not mourning, not mournful, not miserable, not wretched, but glorifying God. Even if you have wounds on your body, you're glorifying God by the strength he gives you. Praise God. So beloved, Jesus, Jesus died in order to find access into our hearts and that we should find access to God in order to come into us and to reproduce in our spirits greater miracles eternal miracles the first miracle in john's gospel was he turned water to wine the first miracle he would do in the heart beloved is to turn the thing that is common to everybody what is common to everybody misery 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 he will turn that miserable heart he will turn it into a joyful place make you and me to be a to sing to God, to worship God, to praise God, to have a testimony, to have meetings like the meeting we first saw at the beginning of Matthew 26, where we come there and there is somebody here who said, I was a leper. Somebody here who said, I saw death. There was something stinking in me, but the power of God has been revealed in my heart and I am now raised from the dead. I am alive in Christ. To give you and me a testimony, beloved, that lives to bear fruit, to bring forth fruit that remains. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is dead again. But he brings us back to life in our hearts that we might live eternally with him. Jesus is passionate about this. He wants to reproduce. I'm not sure if we'll have him back, if he'll return or not. Can but you now, can uh, hear me, bro? Oh, here you are. Okay, brother. Yes, we yeah, no, back. Let me just end up here. Let me okay. just end up here. I'll end up in the meeting we began with. 
that our next church meeting, people will come there and testify and declare, Jesus strengthened me in my heart. Jesus took away the excuse I always had that the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak by giving me strength in the heart to live, by answering my prayers, to live in my situation, to face the circumstances of my life, to cease to be miserable, to give glory to God. Oh, he wants to give us testimonies, brethren. Glory to his name. I think I'll end there, bro. We have been interrupted a lot, and I can see my internet is about to go again. Pray, pray for us before you go, Blasius. Pray for us, brother. Shall that we pray, you, brother? Shall we that pray? What you said, God will work this out in fresh ways in every one of our hearts. Let's pray, brother. Amen. Lord Jesus, that first meeting in which Simon the leper, who had no means, had gathered people in his house to declare your power and your goodness, in which Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were also there as living testimonies to your power. I pray that you will multiply those kinds of meetings by touching each and every one of our spirits, by answering our prayers, and helping us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand to cease to fight, to cease to argue, to cease to hold strong opinions, to let go of everything to, because our lives are in your hands. Please, Lord, bring life into our meetings. Bring life into our spirits. Bring life and victory into our families. Help us to cease mourning and being miserable. And help us, Lord, not because we are strong. Help us in our weaknesses. That it shall be said to each, concerning each one, out of his weakness, out of their weaknesses, because they believed God, they were made strong. I pray, Lord, make our meetings lively, full of life because of your presence. Please purge our hearts and our minds of everything that we have been keeping and holding, whether it be a belief or a doctrine or an idea that undermines the gospel, that does not glorify your name. Purge our hearts from all of that, Lord, and occupy every space, every place in us and be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Glory, brother. Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. When, 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 we, when we, you came back, when we lost before Alex Gillen said, I believe we all got the message. Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Wow. Are you, are Just have you still to there? say hallelujah, brother. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Turn on gallery view and let's 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 just worship. Let's respond. Amen. Un, unmute. Amen. Even if it's a little chaotic, it doesn't matter. This, yeah. this is the moment, God. We, I believe, this has been the word of God, certainly yeah. in my own heart. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Can you sing it, brother? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> to God be the glory. Great. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Continuing to do. <laughs> hallelujah for all who will humble their hearts before yes, Him and glory. proceed afresh the gracious outpouring. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. This Jesus. is incredible. You, are you okay, Bob? Yeah. Amen. Good. Oh, good, Pete. I don't know yeah. how this is. Bob's going to sing to God be the glory. Thank you, Lord. Great Jesus. things. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amazing. So great. Our be the glory. Be the glory.
Great things he had done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Glory, great things he 